meningitis, encephalitis. We won't get the spinal cord injuries today. We'll see how far we get in this. Everybody has simulation this afternoon? Don't forget. traumatic brain injuries, we are talking about injuries to the brain itself. Um, we can have lots of injuries to the skull, to the um, soft tissue, to the scalp, but not actually have an injury to the brain. But we're going to talk about injuries to, to the brain itself. Um, we see quite a bit of traumatic brain injuries. We see the majority of these from motor vehicle accidents. And we also see them as a health risk for children over the age of one. So why over the age of one? Right, they fall? They walk. They're walking. They're mobile and they fall. And so there's several things that um, play into that. One, their heads are abnormally large for their body size. So they look like little bobbleheads walking around. Their heads are doing this number. They've got very weak necks. And when they fall, they don't put out their hands. They tend to fall head first. I'll never forget my little girl walking across the living room and she literally just tripped over her own feet and fell. And I watched it in slow motion. I was like, she's going to put her hands out. She's going to put her hands out. Nope, her hands right by her side, and head first she went. And, of course, she had this nice big goose egg on her head. And I thought, why did you not put your hands out? They don't have that reflex. They've not developed that reflex of putting their hands out. As we get older, we develop that. That's when we start seeing arms that are broke in older children and adults when they fall is because they'll put their arms out to protect their head. But we don't see that around that age of one. So when they fall, they truly hit head first. And so we tend to see traumatic brain injuries um, with that age group as well. So there are some external signs that will indicate that there may be an injury to the brain. And so we're going to look at a couple of these. Scalp lacerations may be an indication that there is an injury to the brain. Now, does it mean because there's a scalp laceration there is an injury to the brain? No, it doesn't. But that just means that that's one of those that we could potentially see um, a scalp laceration could indicate that there is some injury to the brain. A big one is the loss of consciousness. And the time that loss of consciousness, how long that loss of consciousness is, um, is a direct correlation of the severity of the injury to the brain. Um, we also see uh, drainage from the ears and from the nose, otorrhea or rhinorrhea. <laughs> when we have otorrhea and rhinorrhea, the drainage from the ears and nose, we're going to check it for glucose. Why are we checking for glucose? To see if it's cerebral spinal fluid. How do we check for glucose? We do, and what is it called? Halo. It's called a halo test, and what are we going to see? 
because people understand what I, ha I mean that it's a halo test but then what do you see it truly looks like a halo so you put the drop and it's typically blood tinged the drop of blood tinged fluid on paper and what or even cotton you can even do it on like a four by four and you're going to put that drop of um, blood on the on the four by four or the paper and what you're going to see is the blood will stay in the center but you'll see a yellow ring kind of form around it they call it a halo that yellow ring that you see is the glucose it is that um, CSF fluid that you see that will separate out um, and so we look for CSF fluid if we have uh, otorrhea and rhinorrhea with that's positive for CSF fluid then we know we have a skull fracture because there's no way for that uh, CSF fluid to leak out ears and nose without there being a tear somewhere um, in the membranes and in the skull, a, a fracture in the skull. So we'll see otorrhea and rhinorrhea with those. We can also have patients that have head injuries, and we're going to talk about this when we get to spinal cords. They can have head injuries along with spinal cord injuries. Usually if we have a mechanism of injury that is strong enough to cause a neck injury, it is strong enough to cause a head injury as well. So you kind of have to think about the head being um, that wrecking ball. It's kind of on that chain. The wrecking ball swings. The head's injured, but at some point that the neck is injured as well. Um, or if we have an in injury to the neck, we will typically have an injury to the head. We can have fractures of the skull. Uh, again, they're all just definition-based fractures. Some of the big ones we are really concerned about are depressed fractures. That is when the bone actually moves toward the brain tissue. So then the bone fragments themselves can cause injury to the brain. And then when we have open um, fractures. So not only do we have a fracture of the skull, but we have an opening in the skin at that location. What does that set us up for? Infection. Infection. That's the big one. We see um, meningitis and encephalitis quite a bit with open head injuries. So not only do we have an opening in this, uh, the skull, but we have a laceration in the skin as well. Just a direct line for infection to enter the um, brain. And then we're going to talk about basilar skull fractures. So if I said... A patient has a basilar skull fracture. Where on the head would you point to? Base. The base. And you say base, point to it. Okay. That's exactly right. We all go straight to base of the skull. But I want you to remember the basilar skull starts at the temples. What? It starts here and runs here. So you have to remember the head's 3D. So it is the base of the skull and the base of the skull is anything under the brain so it runs this direction in the head so it runs from the temples back to the base of the neck so if you could take the face and the sinus cavities off you would see the basal skull behind the face it is so it actually runs this whole area here which is interesting and why some of this bruising is going to make sense in just a second. The picture to your left is um, mastoid ecchymosis, also known as battle sign. That is indicative of a basilar skull fracture, which kind of makes sense, right? It's at the, at the back of the ears, it's at the mastoid bone, there's some bruising there. Okay, I can understand how that's the basal, basal skull that's fractured. Um, mastoid ecchymosis does not appear initially. It's usually 24 or 48 hours after the injury before you will see mastoid ecchymosis. The picture to the right is raccoon eyes. That is also indicative of a basal skull fracture. But now you're thinking, okay, well if, the, if the basal skull was only at the base of the head, how do we have bruising at the eyes? And it's because that basilar skull starts really in the temporal area. His has a high basal skull fracture. So the bruising is showing up in the eyes, the orbits of the eyes on that patient. Now that is a stock photo, meaning I got it out of the textbook. Um, and that's an ER stretcher. You can kind of see that he's sitting up. He's got a seat collar on. 
you can see the shape of the stretcher and that there's a head wall behind him. You can see the suction and things on the wall behind him. What is wrong with that picture? We know that he has a basal skull fracture. He's got raccoon eyes that are indicative of a basal skull fracture. The NG tube, what's wrong with that? Can we use NG tube for basal skull fractures? Would that increase the pressure? It doesn't increase pressure. You're on the right. You're right. It does. It can make it worse. It is contraindicated. By the way, we never use the nose on a patient with a basal skull fracture. The reason being is that NG tube could actually just go through a very thin membrane and end up in the in the brain. And I've actually seen it happen. We had a lady that came in with a um, a fall who on CAT scan showed that there was, or read that there was no basal or skull fracture. She, in fact, did have a basal or skull fracture. They were putting an NG tube in her in the unit, and they could never get um, a gastric bubble, gastric content. They struggled and struggled and struggled. They finally did an x-ray, and it was coiled in her brain because she had a basal or skull fracture, and as they were putting the NG tube in, it went through the fracture of the skull into the, into the brain. So we don't use the nose if we have a basal or skull fracture for that one reason. We can actually end up in the brain. So in that situation, the radiologist read it wrong? Not that they read it wrong, but everything doesn't show up on CAT scan. So they went back, did the MRI, did find the basal skull fracture on the patient. But um, it just happened to be one of those that wasn't seen on CAT scan. Um, but we don't use the nose with with basal skull fractures. So we can have lots of different injuries to the brain itself, and we're gonna talk about a couple of these. Um, the first being concussions. And we've probably all heard quite a bit about concussions. We hear um, concussions taught, especially with sports. I just went and bought a helmet yesterday. My son's playing tackle football for the first time, and I am totally opposed to it, 100% opposed to it. And I hope you all have got that recorded. So when he has the head injury, I'm going to throw it in my husband's face because he's 10. What is the biggest risk of a contact sport is a head injury. He's 10 years old, and here I am getting lecturing on head injuries. Um, that's why he would, if it was just up to me, he would never play contact sports. But he's ready to, he wants to play, so he's going to play. So I went and bought this helmet. Do you know what helmets are running right now for? For kids, $184 for a helmet to protect his head. Was it worth $184? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's worth $184. But that is outrageous for helmets for tackle football. Almost stroked. I hauled out, I hauled out, called my husband and said, his head will be protected, but it's going to cost you $200. <laughs> so, um, but yes, we see a lot of hand injuries and concussions specifically with contact sports. With concussions, we typically see a very brief loss of consciousness. Um, concussions can range, they can be mild. Um, we can have severe concussions, but usually your mild concussions, that, br that loss of consciousness is less than about 30 minutes. It's what we consider it mild, and that seems like an extremely long time, but less than 30 minutes. The big thing with concussions is this post-concussion syndrome. This post-concussion syndrome can last for a, up to a year or so after the concussion itself, where these um, people have a hard time with concentration, with um, keeping a train of thought. They'll have headaches, nausea, vomiting. They um, will have a hard time with just school in general. Miss um, Williford. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all have had her, but she's one of our 200 instructors. Her oldest son played football for LSU and was planning to go pro, but kept having concussions, and the last one scared him to death. Um, his post-concussion syndrome lasted almost two years after his, his concussion, and they were like, we're done. We're not playing football. This is it. Um, and what we do tend to see is that compounded effect. The more concussions they have, the more severe that post-concussion syndrome the longer it takes for them to recover from it. Um, and so 
there is um, a lot out there right now on post-concussion syndromes with uh, contact sports. We can also see contusions when there is actually a bruising to the brain tissue. We tend to see this a lot in the frontal lobe and in the temporal lobes. And if you think about that, it makes sense. When we have car wrecks, where do we tend to hit? We get hit from the front or the back, and so we tend to see this kind of motion with the head. So we tend to see those injuries with the frontal lobes or T-bones with the temporal lobes. We also see temporal lobe injuries with baseball bats, um, assaults, two by fours, those type things where people will come across the side of the head um, with an object and we'll see temporal lobe uh, concussion or contusions. Diffuse axonal injuries uh, is a high rate, is essentially where we have axons that tear. Diffuse axonal injury just by name, it is all over the brain that we have this injury. Um, we see it a lot with car wrecks. We can see it with infants with shaken baby syndrome. Uh, it is where there is a repetitive kind of bouncing of the brain. And so you have to remember the brain is floating in cerebral spinal fluid in the skull. And as either that baby is shaken or they have that whiplash type effect from a car wreck, that head bounces back and forth. But the brain tissue is made up of gray matter and white matter. They're different densities. And so they move at different rates of speed. And so as they start moving and the head's bouncing, what you'll start seeing is they will start, that brain will start moving at different rates of speed. And when you have that, you have shearing of axons. This is not a vessel that tears. There's not um, an interruption of blood flow. We have a tear of the, of the axons um, that provide nerve impulses in the brain. And so you don't see on CAT scan these big areas of bleed. If they show up on CAT scan, it looks like petechia. It's little dots all over, but we have lots of damage all over the brain. So these brains swell and they have massive um, swelling that occurs with diffuse axonal injury. Diffuse axonal injury also is one of those that the patient may appear normal. You may not see any physical injury to the patient externally, but when you go to assess them, they'll, be, they'll have an absence of reflexes. They won't have reflexes. They won't have muscle tone. They may not even be controlling their airways or breathing appropriately. Um, you may see a very flaccid um, body in front of you and they may look totally normal and it's usually because there's a diffuse axonal injury. That is one of the big characteristics of shaken baby syndrome is that you have a baby with no muscle tone that looks normal. Um, and that is because those axons have been sheared and I'll show you a video on that in just a second. And then we have lacerations. We see a lot of these surface vessel lacerations with our older pa our patients. We're gonna talk about subdural and epidural hematomas. Subdural hematomas, um, we see a lot with our elderly patients, especially if they're on blood thinners and they fall. If you have an elderly patient that falls and hits their head, they almost always have a subdural hematoma. Um, and we'll look at the difference between our subdurals and our epidurals in just a second. But let me show you this on diffuse axonal injury. of acceleration, deceleration, and contact forces. Unlike hematomas and hemorrhages, where the brain damage involves bleeding, DAI affects individual nerve fibers. Nerve fibers are composed of a neuron body and an axon. Nerves function by sending signals from the neuron body down the axon to other nerves. <laughs> 
When acceleration deceleration forces are great enough, they produce a shearing force that severs the axons of nerve fibers, disrupting nerve communication. This disruption causes nerve cells to die and produces swelling in the brain. When the brain swells, pressure in the skull increases and can lead to complications such as restricted blood supply to the brain tissue and brain herniation. So just an idea of diffuse axonal injury. Again, it, there's not a vessel involved, so there, you don't typically see bleeding with diffuse axonal injuries. of injury or the causes of these different types of head injuries. One she mentioned in the video we're going to talk about here is an acceleration deceleration injury also known as a coup or contra coup injury. Um, when we talk about a coup contra coup injury, coup is always the initial point on the brain that touches the skull and contra coup is opposite of that. So it depends on where your force is as to where your coup and your contra coup injury are. So on the left, you see that that's the boxing glove to the front of the face. So as the boxing glove hits the head, the head's going to do what? The head's going to go backwards, but the actual brain touches the skull first on the anterior side of the brain. Does that make sense? Because remember, the brain's floating. So as the head moves back, the brain touches on the anterior side first. So your coup injury is always on the side of your force. Your contra coup is opposite of that. So if the patient was hit from the back, their coup injury is where? On the posterior side. That's right, on the back side, where their contra coup would be on the front. The same thing left and right with your temples. You can go left and right coup and contra coup injuries. But your coup injury is always on the side of the force and it's because the brain kind of stays still as the head starts to move because it's floating in cerebral spinal fluid. So acceleration, deceleration um, is a very common type of mechanism for most of our head injuries. Which makes sense. We see this type of mechanism with car wrecks. With head-on collisions, with being rear-ended, we see that acceleration-deceleration injury. Um, so we see quite a bit of our head injuries with this mechanism. I mentioned there were two types of lacerations, vessel lacerations, the subdural and the epidural hematomas. And let's talk about the difference. An epidural hematoma is a arterial bleed, but it is going to occur between the lining of the skull and the lining, the dura. So from anatomy and physiology, you have the skull, the lining on the inside of the skull is the dura, and this surface vessel bleed t um, occurs between the skull and the dura. When that happens, this arterial blood separates the dura from the skull and basically causes its own little pouch almost. That dura really holds that blood in place. It's a very defined edge to the bleed. A subdural hematoma is a venous bleed and it is below the dura. So you have the skull and then you have the dura still attached to the skull and the venous bleed occurs just underneath that dura. Because the dura is still attached to the skull, this bleed on CAT scan will not be very defined. It'll be diffuse in its edges. You would think just by the epidural bleed being arterial and the subdural bleed being venous, you would think that your epidural bleed would have your highest mortality. In fact, it does not. Because that dura holds that blood in place, guess what that's doing to the vessel that's, that's ruptured? 
It's a, essentially a glutamate. It's holding pressure to it. The more blood that fills up in that dura is holding more pressure to the vessel that's bleeding. The subdural has your higher mortality rate because that blood just kind of um, leaks out into the cerebral spinal fluid, will fill up ventricles, will, will contaminate the cerebral spinal fluid. It has lots of places to go. And so they bleed heavier with that subdural bleed than they do with an epidural bleed. And then, of course, we talked about with our strokes, intracerebral hemorrhages, but we can have ruptures of vessels from trauma in the brain tissue itself. We also talked about intracerebral bleeds with our strokes. What did we say was the highest, uh, we see the highest incidences of intracerebral hemorrhages from what? Hypertension, absolutely. Hypertension during periods of activity is where we see most of our intracerebral hemorrhages. However, we can see them as a um, result of some type of head trauma. Did you have a question? No, okay. All right, when we look at subdurals and epidurals on CAT scan, a CAT scan can't tell you if it's arterial or venous blood without doing some spe specific um, mapping, dye mapping on them, and then they can dye them red and blue. Um, but when you're just looking at a CAT scan, they're in black and white. And so an epidural blo uh, bleed is going to look very similar to this. This is an epidural bleed, by the way. Um, you see how defined the edge is? Because that dura is holding that blood against the skull. Whereas if you look to the right, your subdural is very diffuse in the edge. Kind of just fades into the brain tissue. It's because the dura is still up here attached to the skull. Both of these pictures, and we're going to talk about them, both of these pictures. Now the patient to the right here, their head's actually tilted in that CAT scan machine. But both of these patients have what we call midline shifts. These are two different areas of the brain. This is a much higher picture. So if you think about CAT scans, CAT scans take pictures in slices. And so this picture to your right here is probably much closer to the eyes and the ears because you're seeing the ventricles of the brain there. Um, so it's much lower in the head where this picture on your left is much higher in the head because you're not seeing the ventricles. Both of these patients have midline shifts. So what are we talking about midline? We're talking about this white line that you see there. What that white line is, is essentially the separation between the hemispheres of the brain. So the one on your left, you can see midline, it, I don't realize my hand's shaking until I turn on a pointer. Um, you, the line starts here, and it should run right through here. So there is a shift there. The shift is much more severe in this subdural. So the head's turned sideways, but it should be more like this than where it is. On midline, by the way, you have ventricles. And I'm sure you all remember the ventricles look like a butterfly that mirror themselves on midline. So you have midline, and you should have ventricles that look something like that. They should fold on themselves. They should look identical. They're, they should mirror image themselves on midline, which is what you're supposed to see here. However, we have a midline shift. And so with that midline shift, we have compression of the ventricles. So we talked about with head in, I mean with strokes, how the brain would swell. And we essentially would remove part of the skull to allow the brain to swell outwardly. The body also will take up the space of the ventricles to allow for swelling to cut down on, it's kind of a protective mechanism to cut down on some of the injury. So before we open the skull, that brain starts to swell. First of all, this blood's taking up space that doesn't belong to it. So it's shifting the brain. This hemisphere of the brain's pushing over, and before the body is going to shift the opposite side, it's going to compress ventricles. So what's holding those ventricles open? Pressure. What kind of pressure? What's in there that holds them open? It's not air. Blood. 
Do it now. It's cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid holds these ventricles open. The body is going to, as it shifts, or as the brain shifts and as it starts to swell, it's going to compress those ventricles. And so those ventricles will go from something nice and open like this to looking like something like that. It will compress those ventricles. What it's doing is it's taking up free space. So it's giving the, the brain a place to go before we open the skull. So what happens to this cerebral spinal fluid? Because like, it doesn't just disappear, right? It's still there. Where does it go? It moves down the spinal column. And essentially we just have um, more fluid in the spinal column. We have some fluctuation in the spinal column. So here in this picture to your right, we see a midline shift with ventricle compression that's occurring. That is a brain that is under pressure. Now, we might scan these patients, and when we talk about meningitis, does anybody know, we haven't gotten a meningitis yet, and we're going to get there, but while we're looking at these pictures, we're going to just touch on it. Meningitis, how do we diagnose meningitis? A lumbar, a lumbar puncture. We pull cerebral spinal fluid out of the uh, lumbar area of the spinal column and we test it for bacteria or uh, fungus or viral, depending on what type of meningitis we're looking at. If we took this patient right here and we... Guess what? <laughs> We took this patient and their brain is under pressure. We've got an increased intracranial pressure. And remember they have the frame of magnum, the hole in the skull, and their spinal column. And we went below that area. Remember this brain is pushed out. It's collapsed our ventricles. And that cerebral spinal fluid has moved into the, the spinal column. Now, that increased pressure in the spinal column is holding the brain in the skull, right? Because there's more fluid down there, so it's holding the brain up. If we turn around and we put a needle into the spinal column and we drain off cerebral spinal fluid, we drop the pressure in the spinal column, what's going to happen to that brain? It's going to fall. It's going to fall. There's a word to it. What is it called? It's called herniation. They will herniate. And what's going to herniate first? What's at the bottom? The frame of magnum is the hole. What's going to move through that hole first? Brain stem. Absolutely. Because it's the closest point to the frame of magnum. So if we have a patient that has an increased intracranial pressure, can we do a lumbar puncture on them? No. Intracranial pressure is a contraindication to lumbar punctures. We'll get back to that when we talk about meningitis. Okay? But I wanted you to see the, how much pressure is on that head as to why we wouldn't do a lumbar puncture on these patients. responses to injuries. So we talk, we've talked about lots of primary injuries, uh, strokes, uh, subdural epidural hematomas, intracerebral hemorrhages. All of those are primary injuries to the brain. Well, behind the primary injury comes secondary, respo uh, secondary response. The first one being swelling, that increased intracranial pressure. We consider normal intracranial pressure somewhere between 10 and 15. Some sources will tell you 0 to 10. It varies slightly. They all have come to the conclusion that it's not an increased intracranial pressure until we hit about 20 millimeters of mercury. 
So how, how we have to go to 10, I'm not quite sure. Why it's not zero, who knows. But they consider an increased intracranial pressure at 20 millimeters of mercury. So swelling starts to occur. That is a secondary response or a um, secondary injury or an insult to the primary injury. The second type of secondary response and injury we see is a loss of autoregulation, which can be good and bad. So remember what autoregulation is. Autoregulation is the dilation and the constriction of vessels to ensure continuous blood flow to the brain, right? Brain gets injury and the body says, oh no, can't do my job, and you lose autoregulation. So what does that mean for perfusion to the brain? Do it now. Not necessarily decreases. It's not regulated by autoregulation. Now it is directly correlated to systemic pressure. So whatever their blood pressure is, is the direct correlation to brain perfusion. Whereas before, we could say, oh, wait, the patient's pressure is a little low. Autoregulation is occurring. The brain's still being perfused. Now the pressure drops. There is no autoregulation. Guess what? There is no perfusion to the brain. So it, now perfusion is directly correlated to systemic pressure. Whatever their blood pressure is, is telling us if that brain's being perfused or not. Whereas before we had some cushion in that and we had autoregulation that ensured that we still had some blood flow to the brain despite the pressure because the vessels were changing in size. We also see an overproduction of CSF fluid when the brain is injured. So if you think about it, you have a joint that's injured, a knee. It swells, and then in several days, all of a sudden, you've got fluid on the joint. Sometimes they go in and they draw that fluid off, they aspirate that fluid off. Same thing happens with the brain, essentially. We now, the brain's been injured, the body doesn't know what to do, so it tries to protect it. We protect the brain with CSF fluid. We just kind of encapsulate it, have it in its own little bubble, and it floats there nice and pretty. Well, now that we have an overproduction of CSF fluid, there's a problem with that, though. Actually, let me go back to cats, the casket pictures. They look better. All right, so we have a brain that's injured. Swelling is occurring, but now we're going to see overproduction of CSF fluid. So now those ventricles are going to start opening back up with CSF fluid because we've got lots of CSF fluid that's being produced. What's happening to the intracranial pressure? It's going to continue to rise because we have an overproduction of CSF fluid. That is why we put in ventricular drains in these patients. A ventric drain... Um, Usually, most of the time they put in a ventricular drain with pressure monitor. It's a combination. But essentially, they drill a hole in the skull, and they run a guide wire into the ventricle, and it comes out, or it's a, actually a catheter, comes out, and you usually have hanging on an IV pole a metered thing and then a bag underneath it. And essentially, we lower and raise this bag to depend on how much CSF fluid we want to draw off the ventricles. It is just a gravity type draw. We don't hook suction to it, we're not pulling things out. We lower the bag below the level of the head and guess what? We're gonna draw off more CSF fluid. We raise the bag and we're gonna hold on to CSF fluid. So your physicians, your neurosurgeons will tell you where they want your um, CS, your your meter on your um, ventricular drain. That's your IV pole. And it, you just raise and lower it depending on where they want, how much CSF fluid they want drawn off. So that we are decreasing the CSF fluid in these ventricles. By decreasing the CSF fluid in the ventricles, we are allowing the brain to swell into that space, cutting down on intracranial pressure, and hopefully reducing our need for um, a removal of a bone flap. 
And then, of course, a secondary response. If we cannot control swelling um, in any of those ways, then we see brain herniation, where we see the brain stem move out of the skull through the foramen magnum. And once a patient has herniation, they will die. You don't recover from brain herniation. Now, when do they die? That varies. I've had some patients that died within about two to three minutes. I've had some patients that it took 48 hours before they died. So what do we see hemodynamically with these patients? When we talk about a patient that is having, that's having brain swelling, there's a couple of things we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about um, Cushing's triad, which is an indication of increased intracranial pressure. Um, and we talk about neurostorming is another one, and you may hear that term, where they start storming. Essentially what happens is the brain's under the pressure, remember it controls all body function, and it doesn't know what to do with the pressure. So you start seeing things like hypertension and then hypotension. You see tachycardia, bradycardia. And so what you start seeing are these swings hemodynamically in the patient. They are not hemodynamically stable. So one minute you may have to put them on something because the heart rate's too high. Next minute you're putting them on something because the heart rate's too low. And you're seeing this back and forth, back and forth. You see the same thing with um, pressures. You may see their pressure low, then you may see their pressure high. And they don't necessarily correlate with the heart rate. And you're seeing this odd up and down swing and you're constantly titrating meds, turning them on, turning them off, increasing, decreasing, because we're having what they call neurostorms because that brain can't handle the pressure that it's under. So you see this with um, heart rate, with blood pressure, and with respiratory rate and rhythm. So you may have a patient that will breathe <coughs> three times a minute, you may have a patient that's breathing 60 times a minute. Most of the time they're on vents, so we don't ever let them get below that three. But what you see is a change, or that vent setting. But what you see is a change in the pattern. It's no longer a vent-driven pattern. You may see um, Kuzma's respirations. You may, see, you may see, there's several different ones out there. You may see a very rapid, shallow rate on them. You'll see them bucking vents. You'll see high pressure alarms um, because that pattern is changing or they're not allowing for a volume to increase. So this is neurostorming that we talk about. That is what you see in these patients prior to herniation. This whole time they're neurostorming, guess what's happening to the intracranial pressure? It is typically rising. At some point, you will hit, and it varies from patient to patient, at some point you will hit where they are neurostorming and you may have an intracranial pressure of 30. The next time you turn around, that intracranial pressure has dropped to 15. And now they're hemodynamically, they're stable. Heart rate's 90. Blood pressure's 126 over 70. And on a monitor, they look like they are cruising. Like all of a sudden they have gotten better. All of a sudden, their brain is no longer under pressure because they've herniated, but not because they've gotten better. So as soon as this brain herniates and this pressure drops, hemodynamically, they will stabilize because that brain's not under that kind of pressure any longer. However, the storming stops, but we have lost a brain stem. It is now herniated on the patient. What we will eventually see is they will go from that to just a slowing down of all of it. You'll have, they'll become bradycardic, they'll become hypotensive. They will eventually baseline, settle down, and then they will just brady or down, or everything will just kind of slow down on the patient ultimately to death. But with herniation, you will see a patient go from storming with a high pressure to a drop in pressure and a stabilization of hemodynamic monitoring. Doesn't mean they're better, means they've herniated and they're going to die on you. Um, let's talk about Cushing's triad, because I did tell you Cushing's triad is an indication of intracranial pressure. Does anybody know what Cushing's triad is? Yeah. 
It is systolic hypertension. And some books lay it out as three different things. Some books lay it out as four. And I'm going to show you how they come up with the different type, the di three, three or four ways. All right, so if we have a patient who has a blood pressure of, let's say it's 210 over 105, that is just plain old hypertension. Why? Because we have systolic rise and diastolic rise, and they rise proportionally. That is hypertension. Systolic hypertension is that. Systolic rises, diastolic does not. <coughs> and with that, we have a widened pulse pressure. The distance between your diastolic and your systolic is your pulse pressure. All right, so some cases, when they talk about Cushing's triad, they tell you, one, that it is systolic hypertension with a widened pulse pressure. Others will separate this out and call it systolic hypertension and two, the pulse pressure, widened pulse pressure. That's how we get, some, some sources tell you there's three things, some sources tell you there's four. Your book currently puts them together and puts it systolic hypertension with a widened pulse pressure, all right? So that's one. Two is bradycardia. And three is a decreased or irregular respiratory rate. And notice I said or irregular because if the patient's on a vent, What's their rate? Whatever the spin sets it at, right? 12, 14, whatever we have it set at. So that's where you may see they're breathing irregularly, not decreased. However, if you pause your vent, their rate would drop. Um, so systolic hypertension with a widened pulse pressure, bradycardia, and a decreased or irregular respiratory rate is Cushing's triad. These three things together are an indication of intracranial pressure. Without us putting a pressure monitor on the patient, we know that they have an increased intracranial pressure. What do we know about CO2? I think we have, I don't know if I've covered it yet or not. Somebody covers it, I think it's me. CO2, I think I talked about it in, in module. What do we know about CO2? It's a waste product of respirations, right? Body, the goal of breathing is to swap it for oxygen. What do we know about CO2? It is a potent vasodilator. Right? So now, if this patient is not breathing because of increased intracranial pressure, they're only breathing six times a minute, what's happening to their CO2 level? It's rising. It's a potent vasodilator. What is it doing to intracranial pressure? It's increasing your intracranial pressure as well. So what does that mean for us when we ventilate patients with intracranial pressures? What are we going to do? We're going to blow off more CO2. How do we do that? We increase their rate. That's right. So most patients that have head injuries and an increased intracranial pressure, you will see them slightly hyperventilated, which makes sense, right? We hyperventilate them, we blow off that CO2, we cut out that vasodilation ability of CO2. So not only can we control intracranial pressure with meds and with monitor or with drains and with removing bone flaps and we've talked about all of those but we can also help with vent settings with the way that we have them breathing all right cerebral perfusion pressure is what 
and gave you a formula last week. MAP minus Math minus ICP. ICP. That's right. Math minus intracranial pressure is cerebral perfusion pressure. You will use that formula, especially with these head injuries that have intracranial pressure, constantly to ensure perfusion to the brain. Where do we want perfusion pressure? Body perfusion pressure, 65, right? That's right. So remember, to overcome intracranial pressure, you have to increase MAP pressure. And we've talked about decreasing intracranial pressure. What did we talk about med-wise to decrease intracranial pressure? Manitol. What did we talk about surgically to decrease intracranial pressure? Removing bone flaps. Evacuating hematomas. With the bar holes for monitoring. Drains, ventricular drains. All ways that we can decrease intracranial pressure. And so remember, taking care of these patients is a combination. It's not one or all or none. It is all of them. We do a little bit of all of them, hopefully, to get an intracranial pressure down, a MAC pressure up to ensure perfusion, and to cut out on the anoxic injury to the brain. We also tend to see shifts in electrolytes. We tend to see hyponatremia with these patients. We start with airway. Do they have a secure airway? Do, are they breathing? Uh, do they have a heart rate? Do they have a blood pressure? Those type things. And then we go to our neuro assessment. Remember, we talked about with neuro assessment, we're looking at GCS scores, we're looking at pupils, we're looking at painful uh, response to stimuli, painful stimuli, what are appropriate and inappropriate ways to check for a response to pain. And then what does that pain response tell us? Not only do they respond to pain, but what type of response do we have to pain? Is it a localization? Are they reaching for the painful stimuli? Is it a withdrawal that they're moving away from the painful stimuli? Or is it a type of posturing that we're seeing? Is it a decorticate or a decerebrate posturing that we're seeing with a painful stimuli? Labs, ABGs, we just talked about CO2 being a potent vasodilator. We are going to check ABGs on these patients. Um, we're going to get blood counts on them. We're going to check glucose levels. Electrolytes, again, because we have to worry about sodiums. And we do lots of CAT scans uh, on head injury patients. What happens when we have a change in neurostatus? What do we do? Well, we reassess to identify that they have a change in neuro status. What do we do? We are calling the physician in the anticipation of what? Orders. Orders from what, Jay? <laughs> We're calling for anticipation for orders for a rescan of the head. We're going to scan these patients anytime we have a change in neuro status. So you have a neurostatus change from one hour to the next. Yes, you have to call a physician to get an order for a CAT scan, but you better be unhooking the patient and calling CAT scan and clearing the bed because as soon as you get that order, that's where you're going. As they're waiting on that scan because what they're going to do is they're going to compare scans and most of the time there's a change in the bleed or the size of the bleed or where the bleed's occurring um, when we have a decrease in neurostatus. Many times these patients will go from CAT scan to the OR because that neurosurgeon is sitting there waiting on that CAT scan report if you have a called with a uh, change in neurostatus. By the way, a change in neurostatus is an early sign of increased intracranial pressure. Cushing's triad is a late sign. 
That's why our assessments are so important. That's why we have to understand what we're getting out of a neuro assessment. And with, he with head injuries, it is, I like head injuries first of all. That's probably my favorite thing to take care of are head injuries. What's your son? Um, <laughs> I know. I don't want it to be on him. <laughs> but I do like taking care of patients with head injuries. They're very interesting. I find them very fascinating. Um, but there's also this fine line of there's a neurostatus change and they're still doing exactly what they did the last hour. And it happens all the time. You have a patient, last hour, they would t tell you their name and they would follow a command. But they aroused very easily. You could walk in and say, hey, Jay, tell me your name. And they would give you their name. This hour, you're having to walk over and you're having to shake and you're having to m manually move them to get them to open their eyes. And when you get them to open their eyes, they'll tell you their name and then they go right back to sleep. But then you can get them to open their eyes and follow a command. Are they still telling you their name and still following a command? Yes. But this hour, it's much harder to get them to do it than it was last hour. That is a change in neurostatus, even though they're doing the exact same thing they did last hour. Does that make sense? Um, because now they're just not arousing as easily as they did the last hour. Um, and so that can still be that change that you would call for. But yes, you have to call. Why do we have to call? Because we're ordering a CAT scan. Now, for most other things, if you had a change, you would just go ahead and take care of it. You would titrate, you would add fluids, you would, those type of things. But because it's a CAT scan that we need, you have to have a physician approval for a CAT scan. We've talked about um, assessing these patients. We've talked about positioning. Again, positioning is what? Where do we want them? Midline and, what did you say? Semi-fowlers. Semi 30 degrees. 30 to 45 degrees in midline. What is a contraindication to that? Tell me when you can't put a patient at 30 to 45 degrees in midline. Wait a um, With a CSF leak? No. We'll talk about those in just a minute. You're, you're on a different track, but not with these. What's the contraindication to that? Shock. Very good, Juan. Yes. Pressure. Pressure is a contraindication to it. If their pressure is in the tank, you can't sit them up. So you have to be mindful of their pressure to keep them in that position. That is ideal, that semi Fowler's and midline. But if their pressure is um, hovering in the 60s, then guess what? They're going to be flat. Um, drugs, we've talked about mannitol, we've talked about Lasix that we can follow up mannitol with. Um, we can use Nimbex as another one. We don't use a lot of it in this area. Um, Nimbex, N-I-M-B-E-X, Nimbex. It is actually a um, neuromuscular blocking agent. If we have a patient that is super agitated, we can use Nimbex with them. It cuts down on the agitation and cuts down on the intracranial pressure. We've talked about our different seizure type drugs that we use, Dilantin, um, Keppra, Phenobarbital, we use a lot of propofol. What is nice about propofol? Why do we use propofol with head injuries? We don't use, um, hold on, it just left me. What's the other one we use for sedation all the time in the unit? Um, Presidex. We don't use Presidex. Why do we use propofol and not Presidex? Because with the sedation vacations? It is. Why? What, this, what's the difference in the half-life? It's quicker. You can wean off quicker. That's right. So propofol, half-life of propofol is much shorter than the, pro, uh, the half-life of um, Presidex. So we can turn propofol off and within, depending on how long the patient's been on propofol, usually within just a couple of minutes, 
we can get a true neuro assessment of the patient doing a um, sedation vacation. Where Presidex, it may take three days for the medicine to leave their system enough for us to get a true neurological picture of the patient. So typically you will see propofol used, you won't typically see Presidex used. All right, this video is probably one of my favorite. I've got two good videos on neuros that I like. Um, this one, and then I have a seizure video that I really like. But this uh, is Zach. Zach is recovering from a head injury from football. Um, again, my fear right here. He didn't have a $200 helmet. That's, That's probably what it was. Like he, I should have bought his helmet for him. Um, this video does not have any words to it. It is put together by That's his mother. Like so there are a couple of times we're going to stop and talk about some things that are in this plus. video, but this is probably one of my favorite videos. That's Zach that right there in the center. missing a bone flap there, but we'll get back to that. I would love to know what facility he was in because this is a pretty advanced facility. Alright, so look above his bed. For those that can see that far, what does it say above his bed? Zach is, Zach listening. is listening. Who do you think put that there? Mom. His mom. Mom. Why? Yes, because what kind of habit do we have, especially in our ICUs, when patients are on vents and we've got them sedated, um, do we talk over these patients and not to these patients? Remember, the last sense to go when you die is hearing. And these patients hear and may not be able to respond. We know so little about the brain and how much patients actually are recalling and recount that they were never made aware of. There's story after story of patients who for months were sedated and they're coming out of the sedation and they can tell you vivid conversations that occurred early in their care um, and they could do nothing about it when we really thought that they weren't there neurologically. So when we go into our units, make it a habit to talk to your patient, not about your patient. Um, even if they are not there, Address them by name. Tell them who you are, what you're going to do for the day. Because how unfortunate is it that we walk in and we start poking and prodding and flipping and turning and moving these patients and we've told them nothing. And they are sedated enough, they can't respond, and they are scared to death. And they are just stuck in that body that we have sedated and they can't do anything about it. So tell them, yes, it doesn't change what we're going to do to them, but walk in and say, hey, Zach, my name is Beth. I'm going to take care of you today. We're going to do your morning care, and we're going to start with your mouth. Because guess what? Every time we move that tube, they gag, they cough. It's not comfortable. We'll have patients that refuse to follow commands because they don't want to move their head because of an ET tube in their throat. Um, so just be mindful and talk to the patient, not over the patient. The same thing with physicians and prognosis of the patient, um, especially our elderly. I have seen patients that gave up hope um, and died because of prognosis that were given over beds, that somebody was talking and husband finds out wife is dead and within hours the patient dies um, because we, we, hearing is the last sense to go, make sure we're talking to the patient and anything we would want to talk to that patient if they were there with their eyes open, we talk about outside the room. There's things they don't need to know. 
Um, carry on that conversation outside the room. So this is him with his helmet on. So he's obviously missing a bone flap when they've got him up without his helmet. Alright, so keep an eye on the time frame. This is September, and you can see that he's missing his, his bone flap there. He has still got some significant swelling going on. There's a very abnormal shape to the head. Um, but more so, I want you to look at his eyes. You can just see the absence behind his eyes. Um, you know, they say your eyes are the, um, what is it, the window to the soul. And it is really, truly one of those things that you can just look at him and he's looking at you, but he's looking through you. He's not looking at you. And until you've taken care of a neuro patient, you won't understand that until you see it. But they can absolutely look through you and not see you. Um, and right there, he's got that kind of looking through you look versus looking at you. Now she's super excited because that is the huge progress for a patient who has had a bone plaque removal. Um, he's very flat eyed. Too weak to hold his own head up. There he is in October, he's still got that look to him. Now he should have on a helmet, but because there's about three of them holding him, they don't have a helmet on him. But if he were out of bed, he should have on a helmet.